Hey, I didn't see you there. I was uh, hanging out in the negative zone, you know, just casual like that. So writers and comic book creators are often asked a common question, and that's if you had the chance to write any property that you could think of, whether it's a Marvel or DC or Harry Potter or Game of Thrones or whatever the heck it is, Pac-Man, what would it be? I usually answer this question in a kind of surprising way, maybe. I don't really have like a IP that I'm interested in particularly putting my stamp on. I kind of think about everything that's been done in the world of especially comics and especially superhero comics. And there's just not a lot of stories left to be told. That being said, the Fantastic Four have not gotten a great treatment in cinema thus far. We've seen the examples with the 1994 movie that was made by Roger Corman that was pretty much made just to hold on to the license or whatever. Uh, so nobody really ever saw that and the people who have, it was kind of a joke. Although to be fair, it was probably one of the most comic book faithful adaptations for better or worse. Then there was a series in the early 2000s directed by Tim Story. There were two films. Again, not universally loved. They did okay, but I don't think anyone's like, oh, this is a great Fantastic Four movie or a great movie, period. And then, of course, there was the Josh Trank fan four stick. That Fantastic Four movie that came out, I don't know, maybe about five or six years ago and completely deviated from the sort of classic Fantastic Four as a family of adventurers thing, which was interesting, but nobody liked it and it didn't do well. And here we are. So Disney buys Fox. Disney gets the rights to the Fantastic Four back for the first time in ever. And now there's talk about a new movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that's going to be directed by John Watt, who directed uh, the Spider-Man movies that have done really well for the Marvel Cinematic Universe in co-production with Sony. That's probably happening. No one's set a firm release date. They're talking 2023. No one knows what the story is going to be about, when it's going to take place, how the Fantastic Four is going to just magically integrate itself into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I, however, have actually been thinking about this quite a bit. The Fantastic Four was one of my favorite comics as a kid. I got into it and discovered it pretty early on through reprints, and then I started reading the contemporary stuff. And it was a very different team in the like 80s and like early 90s, but I've always loved that it was a family of adventurers and explorers, and it wasn't, they weren't trying to necessarily stop crime or even save the world, although they inadvertently saved the world a lot of times, but it was like led by a scientist who just wanted to explore cool stuff and, you know, his his love was with him and her little brother and his grumpy best friend from college or what the Air Force or whatever the original story was. And it translates across different eras because it's not tied to like anything particular, even though it kind of came out of the space race of the 60s. That being said, I really dig the 60s aesthetic of the Fantastic Four. And that's an era that hasn't really been explored in the Marvel Cinematic Universe before. We've seen the 40s and we've seen the 70s and now we've seen the 90s. And of course, you know, contemporary era, the 60s have been sort of glossed over. It's like there's been stuff hinted at it. You know, Ant-Man kind of dug into it just a little bit. We only got a glimpse of that world, though. Now, imagine a Fantastic Four movie that takes place in the height of like Mad Men era New York City, like in the mid 60s and places it right in the middle of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that exists without having to do some sort of crazy, like, oh, you know, we somehow got them in from some multiverse or whatever. Like, there's no need for that. This period hasn't been covered that much, so why can't we just place the Fantastic Four right in the middle of that world? Well, here's my pitch for how to make that happen. Buckle in to your Fantastic Car and get ready to go on an adventure with the Fantastic Four. Okay, so we start in modern day New York City. At the Baxter Building, there's a tour being given of the building, kind of like the same way you would with the Empire State Building or any other landmark like that. And it's a school tour and the kids are being shown, you know, all the different features of the Baxter Building. And of course, they get to the top floors of the building, which used to be the headquarters of the Fantastic Four. Through the tour guide's explanation and then like some, you know, videos that are up on screens, we find out that back in the 60s, there was like the first famous family of super adventurers led by Professor Reed Richards and they disappeared one day 
and were never heard from again. And that's why we aren't aware of them in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, because they had this existence and then they went away. So then we zoom in on one of the monitors that's showing like scenes from their exploits and adventures. And we actually zoom in on one that is a scene from Reed Richards and Sue Storm's wedding in 1965. It's happening at a midtown church, not that far from the Baxter building. In attendance at the wedding, are like New York's who's who of the day, right? You've got the Rockefellers and other like real life people, but also a lot of Marvel Cinematic Universe guests that you might expect to see from that time, like Howard Stark and maybe Hank and Janet Pym and maybe some people from the early version of S.H.I.E.L.D. or whatever. And they're all there celebrating this momentous occasion and it gets attacked by someone we'll just call the Mole Man and his, you know, mole people. And he, he's actually a former S.H.I.E.L.D. scientist that worked with Reed Richards, who we end up finding out does contract work for S.H.I.E.L.D., which makes sense because he's an inventor and S.H.I.E.L.D. needs, you know, cool stuff to defend the world or whatever. He knows that all these powerful people are going to be in one place at the same time with their guards down, and he uses it as an opportunity as a sort of get revenge and also show that, you know, whatever project he was working on regarding the subterranean world, you know, was valid. Fantastic Four go into action, maybe Ant-Man and the Wasp get into action, maybe, you know, there's some S.H.I.E.L.D. person there, who knows. They all defeat the Mole Man and the Mole Man's mole people and whatever. And the wedding happens and we end that scene with Reed and Sue and their iconic kiss after they've been named husband and wife. And that's kind of how we open. You get some action pieces, you get to kind of see the Marvel Cinematic Universe at the time, and you also get to kind of experience the beginning of this, this new family that they're putting together. Okay, so a few days later after the wedding, we get to kind of have some downtime with the Fantastic Four at home at the Baxter building. So Reed and Sue are getting ready for their honeymoon. Uh, there's a point of tension there because Reed isn't exactly the type to go like relax on a beach somewhere, but they're going to Greece and Sue is all prepping for it and packing all of her best outfits. And this is really gives us a chance to get to know the Fantastic Four as individuals, as well as kind of get that 60s vibe. Think about X-Men First Class, how like cool it was to mix like the tech and like the Mad Men style sort of mid-century modern look. Like that's what you can experience in the Baxter building at this time. And we get to know the individual characters. So this is where we find out that Reed does this kind of contract work for S.H.I.E.L.D. And also between that and his patents for his inventions, he's able to pay for this spread that they have in Midtown Manhattan over five stories of the Baxter building. We kind of see that Sue is at the time sort of like a, she's a woman about town, a fashion icon. She's sort of like a Jackie Kennedy Onassis, you know, type figure. Of course, Johnny Storm, we see him doing like photo shoots for teen magazines and like commercials for like car accessories and stuff because, you know, he's he's the, the teen hot rod kind of guy. And then, of course, we spend some time with Ben Grimm, which is Reed Richards' best friend. He's the kind of sardonic, you know, big hearted guy who's also really sad because he's also monstrous. And in this form, he's not going to be really rocky and huge yet. He's still going to be kind of the lumpy orange thing that sort of started at the beginning and then eventually kind of they, they defined it more, but this, there's gonna be a reason for that. We'll also hint at the fact that Reed has tried to cure him several times and has failed. So speaking of Reed's lab, we get to see all of the cool Kirby tech totally pimped out. We see, you know, silly stuff like the bathtub shaped fantastic car and all these, you know, projects that he's in the middle of. Well, one of the things that he's working on, what we'll eventually find out is the, is kind of an entrance to the negative zone, right? But we're not calling it that yet. Basically, he's working on some sort of inner dimensional subspace thing that he thinks can maybe be used as some sort of solution for overcrowding or storage or who knows, whatever, some sort of problem he's trying to solve. But right now that device is just mainly theoretical. He's working on it and it's just starting to function. Reed is just really trying to get this machine done before he gets dragged off to Greece for his honeymoon with his wife, which he wants to be with her, of course, but we're gonna see that Reed's maybe not the best people person and he's very narrow and focused. And what we see is we kind of, the camera pans to the rafters of his lab. And in a dark corner, we see a tiny little robotic device with like a pinpoint camera on it. And it's blinking and it's blinking. We cut to an aerial shot going across the green hills of Eastern Europe. 
and we dive through some low-lying clouds, and, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this kingdom appears. It's like old-world European villages meets like high tech for the 1960s, and in the center of all of it, a castle, a fortress. I think you guys know where I'm going with this. As we move through the medieval meets mid-century streets, we see these banners and flags everywhere with the same crest on them, but the people all seem happy and productive. And then we go into the castle, and even though it's a castle from the outside, it's been modernized on the inside somewhat, and we, this is, we find out this is the seat of power of this small nation, and we are taken into a great hall where there's a meeting happening between the leader of this nation and a bunch of uh, ambassadors or representatives from other e European countries. Well, the leader, you guys know where we're going. This is Victor Von Doom. We're in Latveria. We find out through their interactions and their talks that Latveria is this Eastern European country that's sort of like the Wakanda of Eastern Europe. They are an isolationist state. They have highly advanced technology that came from his father's great inventions, something that he's always trying to live up to, and we'll dig into that more. And Latveria has kept itself out of the world wars. It's been the only Eastern European nation in that region to not become part of the USSR. This is all made possible by Von Doom's sort of absolute rule, but he's not gonna be a king in this. He's not gonna be a ruler. He's gonna be the premier for life. Von Doom himself is very regal and very aloof, very commanding and very intelligent. We're gonna dress him in a very nicely tailored suit that may be representative of the colors that you would typically see him in, you know, some lush royal greens. Maybe he's got like some sort of sash thing going on. He is going to have a scar on his face, but he's not gonna be hideously scarred. And that's actually drawn from the comics where he thought that he was terribly scarred after this accident. And in truth, he just had, you know, a, he was still a very attractive man who really didn't do the damage until he ended up putting this iron mask on his face. But we're not gonna even get into any of that stuff. The meeting between Von Doom and these other leaders is interrupted when one of his staff members comes to him, kind of like, it's like, hey, we need your attention. So he dismisses himself and we follow them through the halls of the castle and it kind of tells the story of this being the ancestral home of his family. There's paintings and portraits on the walls to sort of tell the story of his family. Maybe there's like an armor or two from the medieval era that might be reminiscent of the Doom armor from comics. So eventually we, we walk into a great room that sort of looks like mission control at NASA. It's the walls of CRT monitors and on those monitors, we see different scenes of labs from around the world. It's like there's the Pym lab and the Stark lab and there's S.H.I.E.L.D. and of particular interest, Reed's lab. And it's the same view from that little pinhole camera that we saw in the previous scene in Reed's lab. What we find out through the conversation between him and his staff members, he's been looking for someone to develop an interdimensional sort of access device. He's been keeping tabs on all these scientists and inventors from around the world, and his expert scientific staff or whatever thinks they've found it at Reed Richards' lab at the Baxter Building in New York. Von Doom, of course, needs to learn more. What we find out, maybe through a flashback or him having a soliloquy in his private chambers, is that his father, the inventor, actually was working on a device like this to access subspace or whatever it was. And in that accident, his father was killed, his mother was sucked into this other dimension, and young Von Doom was scarred for life. So he's trying to find a way to access this other dimension so that he can get to his mother and rescue her, which Again, it's based on the comics, except in the comics, I think she, her soul was stolen by Mephisto or some crazy thing like that. It's gonna be pretty much the same thing. He's gonna be fixated on A, proving that he's just as smart as or better than his father, who he holds responsible for her death, but also just saving her, which would then make him the hero of his own story. So Von Doom tasks his people with setting up a meeting with Reed Richards. Well, this is at the exact same time that Reed and Sue are going to Greece for their honeymoon. They get in touch with their people at, you know, whatever Grecian resort they're at or whatever, and Reed agrees to the meeting, much to the dismay of Sue, but he's like, look, I, I can't turn down an opportunity like this. He's thinking, look, 
the outside world doesn't know anything about Latveria and the way it works. And he's like, this is an opportunity for us to see inside the black box. And he's, of course, excited by the prospect of meeting this mysterious Victor Von Doom, the premier for life of the nation of Latveria. So Richards and Von Doom meet in this beautiful suite that's overlooking the Mediterranean, and they're kind of feeling each other out. Von Doom can tell that Richards is maybe not the savviest with people, but he's definitely brilliant and perhaps more brilliant than even his father was. Reed can tell that Von Doom's intelligent, but that he's more like Steve Jobs. He, he, his strength is in bringing out the best in other people and exploiting the inventions of others. But Reed's just overwhelmed by the whole thing. And he kind of naively lets it slip that he's working on this subspace, interdimensional access thing, whatever it is. Von Doom internally perks up, doesn't let on that he's super pumped about this, but he's like, hey, I definitely want to, you know, work with you. I'm going to invest in you. Here's here's this Latvarian money that we have for you. And they strike up an agreement to work together. And this is sort of the origin of their story as well. So Reed goes back to Sue at the beach and, you know, he's like, I'm back. I'm ready to focus on the honeymoon, but I'm super pumped about this. I think there's going to be great things that are going to come out of this. I'm going to get this funding from Latveria and we're going to be able to develop all sorts of things we've never been able to develop before, blah, 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 blah. Sue is like, Okay, she's suspect about it, but she's like, can we just like chill out and enjoy some, you know, white wine and whatever. So they get back from the honeymoon in New York City. They're at the Baxter building. Reed throws himself into his projects, right? And in particular, he's working on this subspace access thing. So we see it morph and get bigger and bigger and sort of maybe we do a montage and, you know, the machine he's able to send through bigger and bigger items into this other dimension and retrieve them. And eventually he's able to send the entire Fantastic Car through and retrieve it. And Reed builds this sort of spacesuit armor sort of thing that is designed to send a person into this portal that it will somehow repel the negative energy that he's detected coming from this other dimension. And of course, the suit is going to look kind of a lot like Dr. Doom's armor from the comics. It's not gonna be exact, of course, but if you've ever read, like, let's say, the Secret Wars series, the original one, where he's got kind of a streamlined armor that he puts together to drain the energy from the Beyonder, this is basically gonna be kind of the look and feel of the special safety suit that Reed Richards has created to be able to transport people and not just devices. So Von Doom has of course been keeping tabs on the project, both in actual conversations with Reed, but also through his spy bots. And he's like, oh, we're at the point where we can send people through maybe. I am not gonna wait a moment longer, let my mother possibly suffer in this dimension any longer. I'm going to make this happen now. So he makes arrangements to fly to New York and sets up a meeting with Reed. That day, the rest of the Fantastic Four, Sue, and Ben and Johnny and Alicia, Ben's girlfriend, are out for the day. Sue is complaining to Alicia about how Reed spends all of his time in the lab ever since they got back from the honeymoon. Ben's having heart to heart with Alicia or whatever. And, you know, while they're just enjoying their day and doing, Sue's doing window shopping, Johnny's signing autographs, Ben is too, but some punk kid comes up to Ben and he's like, oh, of course your girlfriend's blind. Why else would she be with a monster like you? He kind of blows it off. Johnny gives him a little hot foot, you know, with his fire powers. And it's a fun little scene. But then after that, Alicia and Ben kind of have a little talk and Ben's like, you know, I am a monster. That kid was right. Maybe you should be with someone else. And of course, Alicia's like, no, I love the man on the inside, blah, 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 all that stuff. Well, they don't have a lot of time for, you know, having this heart to heart because suddenly they see at this bank or facility or whatever across the street, it's under attack by people with really weird technology that allows them to do stuff like there's anti-gravity discs and there's a guy who shoots like crazy adhesive stuff and there's all these all these things happening that we find out Von Doom set up to keep the Fantastic Four minus Reed distracted so that he can deal with Reed in his lab. And we find out that he basically gave all these inventions to these criminals and they're gonna be like C-level, B-level, like Pace Pot Pete or the Wizard, it's gonna be these kind of, kind of guys. So the Fantastic Four minus Reed is tied up with that. Back at the lab, Von Doom arrives and Reed's like, okay, well, here's, here's my progress report and Von Doom has come with technology that can negate Reed's stretching powers. 
Maybe it's some sort of cosmic ray absorption thing. Who knows? Whatever it is, he disables Reed's powers. He says that he is going to go into this other dimension, that he is going to go and rescue his mother. And Reed's like, look, the, the suit's untested. We haven't sent a man in yet. You don't know what you're doing. If you, if you don't follow the proper safety protocols, you could cause some sort of interdimensional rift. And Doom's like, I'm not an idiot. I've been following this stuff. You've shown me the specs. I know how this works. So he puts on the suit. So he's in the sort of quasi doomy armor now. And he goes in. Right after he goes in, the Fantastic Four breaks into the lab. Reed tells him what's going on. And he's like, we need to go into this other zone, into this other place with negative energy, this negative zone. And we have to stop Doom from causing some sort of bad stuff from happening. They all suit up except for Ben because Reed didn't develop a suit big enough to contain Ben because he was not planning on having everyone go in. So they suit up, they go in. So we're now in the negative zone and it's all Kirby crackle everywhere and it's all the weird stuff you expect to see. So the Fantastic Four minus Ben finally come across Doom and they confront him. But before they can really get into it, a bigger menace appears. It's like some sort of negative energy monster. And it's basically it's basically a nihilist. That's who it is. It's a nihilist. Uh, maybe it's a bug shaped, you know, a giant bug shaped energy. They have to kind of all band together to try to fight this guy because their powers aren't working right. And there's only so many of them. But the struggle's sort of useless. Reed's like calling in a suit back to Ben. He's like, hey, you need to you need to get us out of here now. And and Ben's like, well, if I do that, then Von Doom's going to come back and then we're going to all be screwed. So he's like, I'm going to come in there and my 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 hide, my powerful, strong hide is going to protect me. Right. And I've got enough power to beat this thing back. And, you know, we'll close up the portal and it'll be done. Ben jumps in and he's right. His hide does kind of protect him from the negative energy, but it still starts to transform him. And that's where we see him become the rocky kind of bigger kind of craggly thing. They managed to defeat the energy monster or whatever. Uh, maybe Reed uses some technology, him and Victor sort of do a thing together. But in order to keep the energy monster from escaping out into the positive world, they have to close the portal behind them. They do that and the portal shuts down and then we cut the black and that's it, they're gone. And we come back to the present day and we come back to that tour. The kid's like, hey, whatever happened to the Fantastic Four? And the tour guide's like, you know, kid, nobody knows. In a different world, if Stan Lee was still alive, I could see Stan Lee playing the tour guide. But the tour guide's like, nobody knows what happened to the Fantastic Four. Well, then we take a camera and we go through the empty floors of the Baxter building and we go into Reed's lab and we see there's a light blinking on the negative zone access device. And then suddenly sparks and Kirby crackle and smoke and all sorts of stuff. And what do we see? Last shot is just two stretchy arms coming toward the camera. And then boom, credits. They're set up. They're coming back to the present day Marvel Universe. And now you've told their whole story without having to kind of get into the like rocket ship to the stars and cosmic rays and whatever. Like we meet them when they're already together. We we go through adventures with them. We meet Von Doom. He becomes, you know, sort of a menace. They disappear. And that's why we haven't heard from them for 50, 60 years. And now they're set up to be able to do rad stuff in the Marvel Universe, just the same way that Captain America did in the Avengers. I know it's perfect. I'm brilliant. You guys uh, are super excited to see this movie that will never get made. I'm sure that producers from Marvel are watching this and going, that guy's got some good ideas. He should work on the script. And I'm just gonna say, you're right. You absolutely should hire me to write that script. And John Watt, if you're watching, just make it awesome, make it fun, use a lot of color, use a lot of Kirby designs, Hey Jack Kirby's family, that'd be cool. I think it would be a really fun time, a tromp through the 60s, and then we can have the Fantastic Four team up with the Avengers in the present day, and whenever they do their, you know, next crossover thing, whether it's gonna be Secret Invasion or Secret Wars or who knows. And uh, that's my Fantastic Four movie pitch. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I don't know if I'm gonna do anything else like that, but I just wanted to put it out there. Now I'm gonna go into the negative zone. Bye guys. Well, thanks for coming along on that adventure. I hope it was as exciting for you as it was for me in this hot garage. 
And uh, make sure to like, subscribe, and uh, tell your friends about all the other content on this channel that's not the same as this. I know, it's not a great strategy for building a YouTube channel, but I've been doing it for like 15 years, so it is what it is.